So hi, Amy, thanks for joining me. Um, if you could just introduce yourself to anyone who might not have yet heard of you. <laughs> uh, my name is Amy Umble. I am a wood carver um, and podcast host, and I am starting to illustrate things. I do a little bit of everything, and I live in Southwest Pennsylvania um, on a farm that's been in my family for like maybe I guess I'm the fourth generation so cool yeah. mm -hmm. oh wow yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I love hearing about the like generational stuff like that because like the house like I grew up in London and the house I grew up in doesn't exist anymore you know it, it's oh. been knocked down and there are flats there now so uh <laughs> yeah it's it's so interesting oh, no. to yeah yeah <laughs> oh, yeah and and so you said you're a podcaster. So what was what was the name of your podcast? It's called Cut the Craft. Love it. <laughs> so I have a podcast with my co-host Brian Beidler, who is a bookbinder and toolmaker in Indiana. And we just became friends through Instagram, which is kind of funny. And um then we were like actual friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so like I've been to his house and he's been to my house several times with his wife and, um, and uh, yeah. So the, the idea for the podcast came about through, I went to his house to, to learn a little bit about that. And we were going to do kind of like a skill share um, with wood carving, but the book took a little bit longer than we had anticipated. So he just pitched the idea, these really great comments. We love crafts people and we always want to know about their stories and um, what their motivations are. And let's just start a podcast. And I said, so the book was taking a while and we didn't quite get to spoon carving, but we always have these fantastic conversations about craft and crafts people. And how interested we are in the people themselves a little bit more than what technique they're using and that sort of thing. Yeah. So, and for, I personally realized that like, I was traveling in Sweden and um, several other, like Australia and different places. I was much more interested in just talking to the craft and a bunch of things from them. <laughs> right. And I don't know, you know, it's kind of interesting how we come around to that sort of stuff. But Brian said, well, why don't we just start a podcast? And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Had you ever done any, any podcasting before then? Oh my gosh. No, never. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. That was like, all right, let's do that. So um, Brian, he, he does the editing and it, he it's like the bulk of the workload in my opinion and he's just super gung-ho about it so cool so he took that on and i do a lot of the um social media and we sell we're gonna actually we have a patreon so we're going to start um we we're at a point now where we can like, people we have, oh, here. We're gonna have some little notebooks that are hand bound by um uh it's really great letterpress um artist uh herringbone bindery that's that's her name on um instagram i can't quite remember her first name but she's really great so it's starting to take off and we're really excited about it because uh it i think it kind of fills a gap where there are a lot of conversations happening at meetings like you know spoon fest and all that kind of stuff but you know that's just a small group of people and I thought oh wow we're like reaching all these other crafts with those sorts of conversations yeah. and and so it's really nice because um it's just making a huge difference in helping people feel connected I think yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think everyone responds really well it's like speaking just from like the spoon carving community as to, to how supportive that is like it's nice to find a corner of the internet where people are generally quite nice to each other um, yeah. you know 
it's, you know, un unless you start talking about sandpaper and like what oil to use your, uh, to finish your spoon with, we don't <laughs> tend to get too divisive. Um, and so, yeah. And, and I don't have much experience of like delving into other craft areas, but I imagine it's pretty much the same. Like makers tend to be quite nice people uh, in yeah. my experience at least. Yeah. Um, so I'd be like, so you've talked to like, I've, you know, I've been listening to a few of the episodes. You've talked mm -hmm. to a whole like range of different crafts. Mm -hmm. Would you feel that there, there are any like threads that, that run through all of them that, that connect different crafts together? The thing that comes to mind first and foremost is the idea of actually Bruce Metcalf talks about this. He's like a craft uh, kind of like philosopher guy. And he talks about the idea of flow and that's connected to people's processes. And it's, it's this concept that was discovered by Mihai Cheek sent Mihai, which is a- I was hoping you'd be able to pronounce his surname. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got, got it. Got it. There's yeah. a lot of consonants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's in there. <laughs> so uh, the idea of flow, which is having a goal that is attainable, but it has enough um, kind of like risk and uh, you have to develop skills in order to get to the goal, but it's, it's not unattainable. So you can like slowly reach that goal and that can apply to basically anything. Um, there are people who experience it with meditation um, with, you know, I, I, I've heard, I saw some things about like computer programming. I mean, it's just like all over the place. So it's something that we're all capable of doing and it applies to craft for people who really engage with the world in a bodily kinesthetic way. And that's all yeah. something that Bruce Metcalf talks about. So it doesn't mean you have to be a craftsperson in order to, to, um, experience flow, but my experience is in talking to all these people that it's like, that's one of the things that is the biggest motivators for craft because they're dealing with the world through their hands yeah. and processing things in different ways. And a lot of time it's like, they talk about it being meditative. Um, they talk about just how much it clears their minds and that, that sort of thing. And that's, really common through every craft and I, I think that is like one of the most interesting things about it because it's not like oh I became a craftsperson because you know I really wanted to make a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> that was my I, motivation right yeah like yeah. I, I really I, I really care about money and so I thought well how, how can I how can I make tons and tons of money? Oh, I know. I'll start carving spoons. Like no one says that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's really beautiful. And it's something that makes me um, inspired with like almost every craftsperson we talk to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that, what you mentioned about that connection with your body, I think is a huge one. Like a lot of the folks that I've talked to, um, so I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and we've got quite a big university here. So I've had a few like quite academically minded people join my classes. And, you know, where, with so many people who are knowledge workers these days, they don't have an opportunity to use their hands much. And like swiping on a phone, like nothing changes with that. Typing on a keyboard, like there, yeah. there's a very different connection between doing that and like the, the way that a blade will pass through wood and you know, being able to react to those feelings. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you describe yourself as a, a wood carver. So is, is, is wood carving something that you often experience flow through or uh, are there other things as well? Yeah, I would say right now that's the easiest one for me because I've been doing it for so long. And it, it's, it's, it's like a comfortable place for me because um yeah because I have everything available and like I can just sit in my chair which uh is my studio right now <laughs> oh sweet so we're, we're in your carving space are we yeah basically <laughs> oh fantastic yeah yeah I just sit in that chair because 
actually it's one of the biggest reasons is because I don't actually have my own work space other than my house. Um, yeah. And I'm working on like fixing up a, an old building on the farm, but that's kind of a longer process. And yeah, um, uh, yeah the, the, I've got the best light right here basically is the reason. So yeah, um, that's huge. Yeah, it's it makes a huge difference. I was carving the spoon last night and I looked at it this morning and I was like, oh my gosh, like I <laughs> it's <laughs> terrible. Like <laughs> yeah. I can't believe I made this. Like um and it you you can really tell if your knife needs sharpened and it does really badly. So there but, I can't um, yeah, I can't remember who said it, but there's someone who who used the phrase the the raking light of truth for that kind of like sideways oh. light that shows off like all the imperfections in your wood. So yeah, yeah. having good light is, is both great and terrible. So, <laughs> right, yeah. the truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, uh, back to your question, the way that I experience like, more than anything is through carving and, um, and, uh, I would describe it as, you know, it, it is meditative because I don't feel there's no anxiety involved at the point when you're learning a skill where it's like, okay, well, if this doesn't work out, you are, there's a lot of anxiety, like you don't know what you're doing. And there's a lot of like still learning the tools and that sort of stuff. And that goes on for, you know, a while, but you kind of break through that at some point where it's like, well, you know, if this spoon doesn't work or if I don't, uh, something, you know, blows up in my face, basically, it doesn't matter because I have the skill to just make another thing. Yeah. And so the only thing that's lost is like a little bit of time normally. So for me, that like busting through that and feeling confident in whatever I'm making, normally it's spoons. There's a lot, it feels like there's a lot less risk and skill uh, with spoons for me, as opposed to if I were making something like, um, like a vessel that looks like an animal or has animals on it. And it's like a custom thing for somebody. I haven't made a million of those, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a little bit different skills or, um, risk of it going all wrong. <laughs> I think I, I think I experience flow a lot more with spoons just because of the muscle memory involved yeah so yeah. for for folks who are just getting into craft be it you know spoons or anything else like how how long would you say it took you to develop like the technical side to be confident in in that to to allow yourself to take risks and not worry if something blew up what was that kind of time scale in for you uh geez I think it took, well, <laughs> actually, it's kind of a fun, funny thing because I, I remember one time I was making this really big, like, dough bowl. When I first started carving, I was really interested in bowls. I really wanted to make large bowls. And yeah. I wanted to finish the whole thing with an ad. And so I was, like, super focused on, like, the ads and the little cuts and, like, everything being perfect. And this is when I first started. So this would have been like, I don't know, six, seven years ago or something, but I was working and working and working on this bowl. It's beautiful. It was beautiful by the way. And I did one last chop and I saw a hole straight through, <laughs> straight through the bowl. And, and I was like, oh, that I, I, <laughs> I, um, I just remember feeling like disappointed, but not to the point where I just was totally crushed. And, you know, I've got more skill now, but I think it's more of a mindset than anything else where it's like, you're not, not every single thing you make is precious. And if you have the idea that you're constantly getting better then the things that happen like that like chopping through your bowl or breaking the spoon or whatever don't matter as much because it's all if you take the mindset of like everything is practice then yeah. it's not as big of a deal but i would say it probably took 
a couple years. Okay. Um, so, you know, I don't know what that means in hours because no. I'm all over the place with, you know, my work, but, <laughs> but that's what I would say. It's interesting with like what you've been saying about how you've reached a point where your, your technical skills are such that you can reach flow. You don't have to worry about the knife grips. Mm -hmm. And then you've kind of moved even beyond that where you're at events and it's the people and the stories that are. Uh, more interesting to you so I, I like the kind of like evolution of the way that you've that, that you've moved through craft so far it's it's, it's really interesting and but you you've also in, in some of your work you've did, done quite a bit of like looking back and looking at traditional patterns and kind of regional uh, crafts local mm -hmm. to yourself so could you talk a little bit more about like the inspirations that you found in that I uh gosh I think I, I started becoming interested in, it was about like drawing and painting and pen and ink and, you know, applying a design onto something else was my medium basically. And so when I was making these bowls or making spoons, I just wanted to like put something on them. <laughs> in addition to the design, I was like, oh, there needs to be something else, like, because it would be fun, you know? And, um, what I was seeing at the time was tradition from England and Scandinavia and, you know, other parts of Europe where the, they were putting um, just different little designs. And I didn't, I didn't know exactly where they came from or anything like that, but some of it was from Scandinavia, a lot of like Sami and like cross, uh, like interwoven, like basket sort of stuff. You can correct me on my, <laughs> on my uh, you're, vocabulary. You're spot on. Yep. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, and I know that, that that itself is not like herringbone pattern. That's all over the place. It doesn't belong to one culture or another. But a lot of that was something that I thought was really beautiful and I wanted to imitate it. But then I, I sort of checked myself and I was like, I feel like, I feel like some of this stuff, if you look on museum archives and that sort of thing, like this probably has a meaning to this culture that I don't understand. And I don't feel comfortable just picking out something that looks cool and slapping it on a spoon or a bowl and being like, you know, here, here we go. I think it came from a place of just being like sort of wanting thing to connect to. And it, once I realized that, that that's what I wanted was like this kind of like a connection to tradition that was, you know, a positive, like reinforcement of identity in one, some way. Yeah. Um, once I realized that that's motivation or that I felt like to pay some sort of identity on things with me, then I thought, well, you know, our country has a certain past and it's not all pretty and it's kind of a, a lot of different ways to look at it. So I thought, well, how can I connect to something that is a tradition? And I thought, well, what is something that my grandma would recognize? <laughs> like, you know, it could be because if that's like a generational thing, that's that's kind of like a cultural tradition in a way. And so I thought, oh, quilt patterns. My my <laughs> uh, my grandma was a quilter, and on well, yeah, one side of my family was a quilter. My other grandmother did a lot of crochet work, so she was in textiles too. It just sort of like dawned on me. I think I was falling asleep one night, and. Uh, <laughs> And it took me, it took me a while to figure out how to draw a quilt pattern on a spoon and make it look okay <clears throat> or on a bowl. I finally, it just, I think it's something that I'm just doing, I guess, painting spoons and putting these like kind of traditional patterns that people in the United States would recognize on, you know, wooden wear basically. And it, it was really popular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it took off. And, yeah, it really took off. And so it was really fun. And I've learned a lot with that. And But I think I've kind of like moved more into reading a lot about like prehistoric textiles now. And some of my work now is really informed by those 
designs and nose patterns and things like that. But I've just started that. And so I'm still like reading a lot and just kind of delving into it that way. But it's it's all very interesting. I, I think it's funny. I have this like crossover between fabric and textiles and woodworking. <laughs> So I don't know. I, maybe I should be a textile artist. <laughs> maybe I should be like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. have, have you done any textile work? Not really. I mean, just enough to know that I like it as like a hobby. Like I, I, it took me a really long time to like knit a scarf, like years and years, but I would like pick it up and put it down and yeah. um, things like that. And I, I have I actually have a big, floor loom like a gigantic one that would like fill you know the room of a house but i haven't anywhere to put it really so (laughs) and that's something i would love to get into i'm actually also gonna try to learn how to spin on a um drop spindle so i've got a lot of goals that are textile related but i just need to like make a spindle (laughs) i need to go over to the lathe and like make a spindle and then i'll be set (laughs) <laughs> yeah. You mentioned earlier that you're you're planning to make yourself a workspace. Does the does the loom have a, a spot in that future workspace? Or would that be like a purely woodworking area? Be small. So I think it's like hmm, maybe like 16 by 14 or 12 or something from the outside. But I don't know if it's worth fixing up or it should just be like knocked down and put something, you know, in its place. That's a good question because I, I have such a huge variety of crafts that I'm interested in. Like I, I just planted willow last spring. So I'm going to try to get into basket making and I'm all interested in uh, textiles and weaving and spinning. And I'm also interested in woodworking and they're all related to fibers and how they work with one another. And so those are my primary interests. And it would be nice to have all those things in one building. (laughs) So yeah, yeah, it would be nice, but I don't know. I'd have to make it pretty big to have room for all that stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, If people want to find out more about your work and and if they want to catch a few episodes of the podcast, where can they go to find all that information? Yeah, my work, first of all, I'd like to get people on my newsletter a little bit more than than on Instagram, but both are fine, obviously. So just www.amyumbel.com. And my Instagram is amy underscore umble. And my website is on there too. I can get everybody all together. The podcast is also on Instagram at cut the craft podcast. And we're on Apple and Spotify and I mean you can't believe you're on, we're on iHeartRadio, just about every <laughs> podcast platform there is. And we also have a website, cutthecraftpodcast.com. Yeah, so you can find us on Instagram, you can find us on some site. And Brian, who's the co-host, also has his own Instagram at BH Beidler. And he also has a website, which I think is bidlermade.com. And and thank you very much for spending your morning with me. Yeah, thank you. It was a really nice conversation.